But he's also saying he doesn't know what's going, you know, like, I don't know. It's not just the, in, in my mind, I'm thinking beyond the subfloor. Like, what else is going on beneath the subfloor? Well, that's what you always think about. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Day and night. Can't get it off my mind. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, a regular discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by GBA Senior Editor Kylie Jacques. Good morning. Fine Home Building Digital Brand Manager Rob Watzak. Hello. And Producer Extraordinaire Jeff Rose. Hi there. Please email your questions to Fine Home Building at fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it is a pleasure to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being on the show. Of course. It's great. Rob, you got to tell everyone what you've been working on. Well, first I got to say that I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed in myself that it seems to take like two years for me to make a new one of these things every, every, every time I get around to it. Uh, but I've got the drivetrain working on my uh, bicycle tractor version 3.0. 3. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I, that I'm the only person laughing at the description of a bicycle tractor. So what do you intend? We know what? Rob, so <laughs> it's like not that unusual. <laughs> what do you intend to do with this piece of machinery, Rob? Well, you know, the, um, the last uh, bicycle tractor, which was just called the bike plow, was... A, a single purpose device and it you know it did a decent job at it uh it was it was a little unstable it was um not geared quite right but i i plowed my driveway with it for like two whole winters and uh it worked with pretty all well. the snow we got in connecticut no but we <laughs> two dustings I, I was getting no this was this year i didn't use it last year i um I hate pushed through at least six inches of snow with that thing no problem i mean granted my driveway is only 100 feet long and it's flat but, well, uh, more importantly, it made you a viral video star. That thing has been yeah. seen gazillions of times, right? How I, many I'm times still, has that been? Oh, I don't viewed? know. By now, Millions. it's probably been hundred million times. <laughs> <laughs> but so the new one, the new one, uh, you could see pictures on the podcast page. Is uh, I've been searching for. I was like, well, maybe the next version will actually be made out of a tractor instead of just bicycles and uh so because that's the logical thing to do (laughs) yeah isn't that what everyone does so um i've been searching for older tractors lawn mowers that had horizontal shaft motors on them had a gear on the drivetrain that was in the correct orientation for pedals because most modern tractors have a has a vertical shaft which i'd have to change the direction of power from the pedals and so i finally found this thing on facebook marketplace last year and uh it was it's bigger than a lawn tractor by quite a bit and it's it was it was originally a commercial mower from a golf course oh cool and uh but the cool thing about it is it's just a square tube frame so i can straddle it with the bike pedals without hitting any chassis you know parts and uh i had to do some fancy welding to make the uh, gear train work on the back and i'm waiting for a new bicycle tricycle seat with a backrest to show up today and then once I mount that thing, I'll, I'll, I'll fine tune the position of the pedals and uh, add the steering back to it. What is the ultimate goal with this uh, rig, Rob? Well, yeah, oh, yeah. So like the original one was just for plowing. But this one is going to be, you know, my, my I'm tired of pushing wheelbarrows around the yard and <laughs> this thing and move picking up rocks with my back. And so uh, I'm, I actually and you're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm actually going to build a little mini bucket on the front of this thing it'll only lift there, there's this thing called a johnny bucket that was po- mm-hmm. that's like popular with like garden tractors and it's like a front end loader but it only tilts like the like a plow and it and, uses like the the geometry to help lift the the yeah, load right you just have a really long either you have an electric actuator or you have a really long lever it's just, i want this thing to be totally human powered it's going to have a really long or or a lever with a big mechanical advantage that'll be right next to my seat so that i can raise and lower it and then the plow will also mount to that same mounting s- system at the front of the you do realize that um, gardeners in portland oregon will be contacting you for Oh, yeah. A prototype oh, oh, drawing. Organic farmers from around yeah. the country. Yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> you honestly think there's a market for something like this? Do you? Oh, Kylie? God, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Seattle, yeah. Portland, gardeners who don't want to contribute to global warming, they'd be all over this. 
What about they, electric they motors and batteries? They ride their bikes to their job sites with their with their tools behind them on carts. I mean, or they have yeah. like uh, what do they call them? Uh, uh, you know, carry all bikes that they use yeah. like in, in in Dutch cities, right? Yeah. yeah. The the big thing is then people always get on me about this. Like, oh, you'll never push anything with that. I'm like, you gear something down low enough, you have a mechanical advantage, you can move anything. I mean, I I can the old one, which wasn't geared great, but it was very low, I was able to use the plow to push gravel in my driveway. And this thing is gonna be geared <laughs> down like ten times lower than that. Plus it has a, a at least a seven speed transmission. I might actually put a fourteen speed transmission on it. So uh could you get a rake on there and do some grading with it? Oh yeah. In fact I, I saw a little mini harrow for sale the other day. A little uh a little um what's it, what do they call those things? Those little rakes. A York these, rake. York rake, that's it. Yeah I saw a York rake for sale. I just passed it up though but uh yep, but, well yeah, man How's the family uh, endorsing the project here? You know, I've been working hard around here on, on projects. I figure it's time to work on a project for me for, for a fun. little bit. So I, they're happy with it. They're happy that I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, what have you been doing? Nothing. <laughs> Is that good or do you feel guilty about it? Are there things you should be doing that you're not? Um, well, it, it's funny. It's like I'm sure I was doing something, but I couldn't tell you what. Mm. <laughs> you know, other than mowing the lawn and exciting things like that but just that can be good though you know yeah. not you don't have a big list of things that are worrying you you just kind of go with the flow oh i know what i yeah i was i was installing a a uh, water line moving a refrigerator so i have a ice maker in the garage that's not nothing <laughs> I think that's cool. Yeah, I just yeah, I don't cool. remember what it was. Yeah. <laughs> it's all one So the bar water. is next, right? Because you need something yeah, right. to do with the ice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How'd you tap into the existing water line? Did you use one of those little cheap uh, no. saddle valves? That, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was the thing. It's like, I did not want to go to a saddle valve, and I did not want to go with plastic pipe. or. We should tell folks what a saddle pipe. valve is. Who wants to explain it? It's basically like uh, almost like one of those electrical connectors you use for landscape lighting, where it actually doesn't make a positive connection; it just punctures by by pressure, right? And so the valve has a. Has I try like not a, to explain things with more complicated things. Yeah, I know. I, 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 that, that was actually coming to mind when I was uh, when I was saying coming out of my mouth. Basically, it's a it's clamp. a clamp that goes on a pipe that punches yeah. a hole in it. Is that's what it too does. That's yeah. too simple yeah. an explanation. <laughs> yeah, so it's basically. Incredibly leak. And yeah. It, yeah, it's just a matter of how long from now is, is it going to leak, right? Yeah. So don't use those folks. They're, they're great for plumbers because inevitably they have to come fix them. <laughs> how about you, Kylie? What have you been doing? I did a little sleuthing yesterday because I've got a situation unfolding that I, I kind of got a kick out of this. I wound up, I saw some sawdust piles um, at the below the riser at my front door that so um i wound up looking into the anatomy of door structure and the entomological life cycles of carpenter bees and carpenter ants to try to figure out what i had going on and then i sent this photo to matt saying do you think water's getting back here um, behind that front-facing board, which I guess Mike Gurton calls a riser, because I, I couldn't figure out what the right term for it was. It wasn't the sill. It's not quite the threshold. And so Matt looked into it, of course, and came up with So it rise. looks to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, it looks to me like you have a step in front of your door. Is that yes, correct? Yes, it's a step. Yeah. So essentially, so it's, it's a wood it's like step, a, yep. and it has a wood riser. Right. And under the wood riser were these little piles of sawdust. Sawdust, right. So... Um, I think, you know, in the gardening world, you're always kind of wondering, like, is this tree dead because insects moved in or were there, there did insects move in because there were um, environmental factors that were stressing the, the plant, the tree, whatever it is, um, and that's what killed it. Um, and so it's the same sort of situation, like, are these carpenter ants or carpenter bees, whatever the case may be, moving in because there is water getting back there. I think the construction of that mat seems to think there's a, because there's no overhang protecting that board, like the sill is very shallow. So it's very conceivable that some moisture, I wouldn't say bulk water because I have also a, an overhang on, over the um, slab. So it's being protected to some degree, but moisture could be getting back there 
which would of course make that wood attractive to either of those insect species. But so how, the, how, had, do you want to worry about this or do you not want to no, worry about I got, this? Of course I don't want to worry about it. Kicked it. <laughs> I looked around <laughs> to see if I could determine what kind of insect was there. Nothing's hovering. I guess uh, carpenter bees tend to hover around. So I've been keeping my eye out on it, but I haven't seen anything. Um, those are I carpenter did, bees. I did pull out do you think, well, then, then my plan of attack is, is not a very good one if it's carpenter I would just leave them alone. For unless sure. Unless you're really worried about they're going to destroy the no, integrity of I'm your not, step. I'm not too worried about it. I just thought it was kind of an interesting situation. I, it, Matt helped me determine that my, it, the construction is not, was not done right. Um, so that was something to be learned. Um, yeah, I mean, one, I, thing, I, one thing you kind of hard to with... please. That's what I would say. <laughs> Well, he sent me a photograph of a similar situation that he has, and there is a little bit of a lip. So it makes sense to protect that gap. To put, the, to put the, the, the tread or the riser a little bit interior of the tread, is that what he was of the, saying? Of the sill, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. to bring it in a little bit so water drips off the nosing of the, the tread. The nosing, right. Yeah, there is no nosing. Exactly. There's no nosing. Right. Boy, I would think of, I would try and worry about something else of greater consequence. <laughs> well... <laughs> There's a lot of insect activity and squirrels in my walls and, you know, things are eating my house. So when I saw that, I thought, oh, I'll just add it to the list of <laughs> critters that I live with. Um, Squir squirrels yeah, in I'm your not... walls, bats in your belfry. Yeah. <laughs> I would worry more about the squirrels. Yeah. 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 So I was looking at those little sawdust piles and there's not really a whole lot of space between the deck and where that is. I mean, carpenter bees usually are in like overhangs uh, up high and I'm... and carpenter bees don't really care. They're not there because of the moisture, but uh, most other insects would. No, be. They're, in fact, they're putting an egg in there and making yeah, other carpenter making a bees. Home. Yeah. I don't they know how usually, they would get in there. There's very little space for them to get in there. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's it's too low, I think, for carpenter bees. So, I mean, get out chances. of here. I have tons of carpenter bees all over this place, and they go anywhere that has a horizontal wood surface. They yeah, do not yeah. care. I, but, I watch well, this is a vertical wood surface. I watch, what's that? This is a vertical wood surface. No, so it's vertical, yes, but they're on the underside of it, on the horizontal uh, edge of it, right? Oh, right. They're getting in from underneath. Yeah, because yeah, it's protected from rain that way. They basically like exposed wood that's in a relatively uh, protected spot. And it has to be a certain width for them to want to drill a hole in it because they need their substantial little tunnel that they have to and build. And you're totally right. They, um, they're they are a, a pair, and one of them flies around all the time protecting the other one that's drilling the hole. And that's I why I don't think that's what it is, because I've not seen any evidence of that, and yeah. I've been looking. If you hang around you... there, uh, and it's what? carpenter bees, you will totally see them, yes. Because they, they, that's what I'm they saying. will buzz. I'm yeah, not they, seeing yeah, them. Yeah. But yeah, I don't that, think you're that there looks enough. very similar. It looked very similar to when my beam rotted away and fell down on my pergola um, in the back patio. It was because I didn't protect it and moisture got in the cracks and these little tiny, they almost looked like little wasps, but they were like, they were burrowing all kinds of holes in there. But there's so many bugs that like wet right. wood, right. you know, so it's hard to say without seeing them. It's well, insects. do you think I should, I'm going to set out some traps. That traps? feels like something no. I can do. I think not, you're not traps, like little, um, what are they called? Oh, like sticky um, uh, flypaper? Yeah. To see no, what... no, no, no. They're like little, um, I use them elsewhere too, and they seemed effective. They're little, I don't know, trap is the only thing I can think of, but you, you, it's got a liquid inside. You pull out the tab and bait? then whatever insect, bait, thank you, that's the better word. Bait, bait traps. Why do you want to kill them? Well, because they're clearly doing some structural damage in there. Well, no, they're not. No, they're just they're just finding the damage, and they're just ma they're just making it worse. So I think you need. If, if <laughs> I don't know. If you're worried, if you're worried about the bugs, you need to you need to at least Pull take the a board off. Take yeah. a piece of wood. Take a piece of metal and poke around for soft wood, or uh, or pull that one board off. Pull that yeah. one board off, and then yeah. what? See if it's wet underneath it. And, and then, then replace what? it. Just replace the wood, but that doesn't well, get rid of the problem. No, but you have to see what's wet, and then you can kind of do some more sleuthing to see where the moisture might be coming from if it's a flashing detail. So what you or... should do is tear it all apart and then come back on the podcast and yeah. then we'll right. tell you what to do. All right. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I'll lend you some pry I'm going to start with my bait traps before I pull it all apart. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Yeah. Oh, I think that was fun. <laughs> uh, so... We heard from, you know, uh, we got a bevy of emails regarding our brief conversation about spiral duct work. Were either of you on the show uh, when we talked about that? 
That yeah. sounds familiar. Yeah. Yep. Um, so this uh, first email comes from Mark in Northeastern Massachusetts. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of the podcast and I enjoy listening while I'm working on one of my many home projects on the weekends. During last week's show, you jokingly talked about the use of exposed spiral ductwork in a finished home. I don't know. Was it joking? We I, was, I, was, I, was, I was serious. I was serious yeah, too. Yeah, I remember talking. Yes, I think we all sort of liked it. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and I think uh, people might have thought we were joking because it is kind of out there, right? Uh, I thought I'd send along a photo of my recently completed new home where I featured exposed spiral ductwork in the finished basement. I'm an HVAC engineer by training, so the design and installation of my new system was something I care deeply about. I designed a variable speed and capacity air system with a distribution ductwork located in the basement. The system has four temperature control zones, 17 zone dampers, <laughs> controlled from a Lenox iComfort multi-zone module. I also installed an HRV unit to provide fresh air to my aero-sealed building envelope. One air change per hour at 50 pascals. The system is super comfortable and extremely efficient. The spiral ductwork in the basement has an industrial feel, and the branch ducts are neatly tucked between the floor joists. Did you guys see this amazing yes. ductwork? Yes. It's beautiful. <laughs> I also I, appreciate his amazing uh, home gym. It looks like it, it would be so cool nice space. to work. Yeah, it's such a cool space, and to, to be able to work out down there and know that you've got good air, and you know, it seems like a, a really sweet environment. I went to the uh, Linux website because I was like, ductwork zone valves. I mean, I knew about zone valves from hydronic systems, but I didn't know they had zone valves for the ductwork. But it's like this pretty serious system with all these, you know, smartphone apps and electronic controls. And I mean, it, you know, it makes sense. I mean, it's like so many systems are not really designed to meet this very specific needs. Every single house has a different layout and airflow and volumes and uh, ceiling heights and it, you got it, but you got to have somebody like this, uh, like him, as who's an actual HVAC engineer to yeah. do that. So, Mark, get ready for some questions <laughs> because you know yeah. people ask us all the time about ductwork design. So you're our go-to guy. <laughs> yeah. Can we can we get him to write a blog for us? I mean, yeah, seriously, that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, so we'll put the photo on the page, listeners, and you got to check out Mark's basement ductwork because it is quite something. Fantastic. Uh, so we also heard from our longtime friend, Mike Gurton. Hi, Patrick. I think it was in podcast 358 where you briefly discussed using spiral duct and leaving it exposed. When my HVAC guy came out to discuss installing central air in my mom's A-frame house, I already had a plan. Exposed spiral duct resting on the top of the rafter ties. There are no walls and no attic in the house, and I figured it would be best. It would be the least objectionable air delivery option there was already a closet on the second floor where we could position the air handler. Modern commercial design often embraces the mechanicals and makes them features. If mechanicals can be exposed, it simplifies HVAC delivery. And as a side benefit, it makes service easier. Hopefully, residential designers can convince homeowners to expose more of what we often spend a lot of time and effort concealing or jamming in a hot attic. So Mike sent a picture of his spiral duct work, which is also pretty cool. He says... Uh, don't ask about the odd arrangement of ugly ceiling fans. They're the remnants of my father's attempt to circulate the warm air that hangs out at the peak of the house in winter to I the lower floor. That. And please ignore the eye joys gangplanks. They're my avenue to raise and lower the insulated skylight covers in the late spring and fall. Handling a 28-foot ladder inside the house was becoming a pain. Um, I, I, love I hear this about A-frame homes, right? That the, the, oh. the air stratifies and, and you know, it's always a struggle to... People try all kinds of ways to mix it, but it's difficult. Yeah. I, I love that. You know, the collar ties were there. You just rest them right on top of the collar ties and you're good to go. It's like <laughs> stick the air handler in the closet. Yeah. It, that's, that's, that's it works great. perfect, right? It's kind of two extremes. We got the very like low buck, uh, easy solution. And then Mark has the very high tech, you know, precise solution. It's kind of cool. But um, I think about that all the time. It's like, you know, our houses, the, the way we build houses plaster drywall walls and you know cladding on the outside in these hollow cavities is from a time you know it dates back to a time before there were mechanical systems in houses and uh, the fact that we bury them all in the walls and then permanently seal them up right. and then every time you have to work on some plumbing or duct work or add to your system you got to make a big hole in the wall I mean it's not that big a deal to us but to the average person, the idea of tearing a wall open when you've got a tiny little water leak or, 
or you want to you you want to improve something it's just i don't know right daunting mm -hmm. yeah uh so i sent uh mike mark's photo that mark sent to us ahead of the podcast and he's he mentioned in the fine home building um house that he built he spent a ton of time uh, hiding the basement ductwork and mechanicals right and he should have just left it exposed because he liked the look of it too so there you go yeah people should accept it more right i think so i was looking at my own house thinking like I want to look at that. <laughs> I, I would, you know, and it, my house is set up so like one spiral duct truck line down the center would be super easy and efficient and it would deliver it right, you know, right where it needs to go. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, that would work great for your house. <laughs> the barn too, you know? Yeah. I need some spiral duct work because anyone <laughs> out there has any <laughs> looking to get rid of. <laughs> um, so this comes from Wayne. Good morning, Patrick. Attached is a good article in the Construction Specifiers Canada's June 2021 Construction Canada magazine on this topic, perhaps a good topic for discussion on a future FHB podcast. Did anyone read this? I scanned through it, I yeah. It. yeah. I mean, it was- What's it, it was, about? It was about- <laughs> didn't read it. <laughs> it was, it's, it's, a, it's basically a common thing about, um, you know, masonry or stucco claddings and how, um, you know, when they became popular, what is it, in the 70s, 80s, um, bef before we knew about WRBs and flat, good flashing details, how he, there's a quote in there. He talks about Joe Stiebrick talking about the coming stucco apocalypse. <laughs> I think it's here. Yeah. Ask, yeah. ask anyone in southeastern Pennsylvania and uh, it's here. Yeah, I, yeah. I found the article that Joe Stiebrick wrote called the coming stucco apocalypse. Stucco apocalypse. How do you say that? Uh, and, he, and he's like, how can you take a system with thousands of years of history and screw it up? E <laughs> e easy. Keep improving it until it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, coincidentally, Martin um, has a post going up tomorrow. It will be up by the time this airs um, called Preventing Algae on Stucco and with Flashing and Overhangs. Um, and I'm not sure where he was traveling when he took all these photos, but it's all of stucco buildings. And he just is emphasizing again and again in different ways um, the importance of, of overhangs um, or some kind of, you know, protective lip. Um, and all of these, these were mostly large, I, not commercial, but like multi-housing apartment buildings in what looks like a Mediterranean climate. And most of them were just covered in black algae and um, yeah, the, the problem is though that a lot of the the architectural styles that use stucco naturally don't have, you know, overhangs like adobe right. and but but the thing is I mean really the the big thing I, that I, people think, are I think you're shooting from the hip there Wadsack. I think those uh have selective overhangs meant to help those buildings last. Sure, sure. Yes. And I mean uh, that's not to say that you shouldn't be putting them on them, but but I mean certainly the the main thing is having the right building assembly with the red WRB and a drainage layer and where I, I remember these are these commercials you probably saw commercials like this back when you were a kid Patrick there, there's a place in New Jersey and I'm sure there are places like this all over Pennsylvania this place in New Jersey Garden State brick face and stucco and like I swear to God it was like every third commercial when I was a kid <laughs> and uh, you, you go all over New York City and all the surrounding you know urban areas and there's so many of those those sort of uh, fake stone clad buildings. And I remember in Pittsburgh, we saw those when we were riding our bikes around that time. And uh, so I actually went to see if that company was still around and they've changed their name to Garden State Brickface and Siding. Uh, but they actually had some pages. They got too many calls from lawyers trying to <laughs> sue them. They're like, oh, well, this is the company did the stucco. <laughs> well, I think they also just branched out into a broader area. But the, I found uh, they have an EFIS siding with drainage system blog post on their website. And it has a diagram of all the different, you know, drainage and uh, WRB layers. So they, they, they've definitely got their act together. I don't think they had it together in the 70s. But the EFIS industry has totally fixed up their act. They had a bunch of failures, but they got some uh, consistent consistent details together to give their installers. And I'm pretty sure if you follow them and, and uh, use the right products the way they're you know meant to be used, uh, you, those are reliable systems. And the cool part is you get the insulation on the outside of the building. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, you know, they all seem to have weed whacker damage, every single one I've <laughs> seen. But, uh, you know, that seems like user error, not problems with the building. Sure. When I was... Uh, 
following around one of these stucco inspection crews uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania. You know, they drill holes under window openings um, randomly, and they do moisture readings with a long um, moisture meter, right? And they measure the moisture content of the wood sheathing, and they're all bad. I, I said, what percentage of these homes have problems? And he's like, all of them. I was like, no, really, what, how many? And he's like, no, all of them. Oh, there's never a home we inspect that doesn't have water damage behind these stucco because the, the homes are built around the same time and the detailing was bad. Didn't Christine Anderson, um, excuse me, um, Williamson do a webinar yes. with us about oh, yes. this topic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you folks have interest in that, watch that. What is it called? I think stucco, no, stucco, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on stucco, our website. I'll put a no, link in the... So anyone out there who does this correctly, stucco installation or does remediation work, I would love to talk to you about a feature article. It's on my most wanted list for, mm. it's been years, I would say. So please, the problem I've run into is folks are uh, hesitant to go on the record because they're worried they're going to get sued mm. later, either uh, frivolously uh, is, you know, even do people just sue stucco installers, right? So everyone's scared. Speaking of which, um, this comes from Carlson. Who is this? I'm sorry. I don't know who this is. This came from our uh, website. But anyway. Hi, all. We're building a modern Mediterranean home in central Oregon. This exterior is stucco and stone, and there will be wood faux timbers over the top of each window. See the sample inspiration picture below. I'm trying to decide on what type of wood would work best as a timber header. Western red cedar, Douglas fir, or some other type of wood. Something that won't rot easily and won't need yearly attention is what I'm after. I like the way cedar ages and turns gray over time, but in central Oregon, we get snow and low temps, so I'm not sure cedar would get moisture stains. I have Douglas fir timbers in an outdoor patio slash kitchen on our current home in the Northwest, and the beams that see direct weather need pressure washing and stain every other year to keep them from turning black. I'm losing the battle. Does anyone have experience or advice about the type of wood that works best in this application? I'd also be interested in any flashing advice. I have solid plans and details for waterproofing and flashing for the top of the timber, but I'm scared about the lower left and right corners. The timbers extend four inches horizontally beyond the window frames. So the lower left and right corners will be in contact with the stucco. How do you keep water from getting trapped in the corners? Sorry for the long post. I appreciate any help. Thanks. All right, so we should uh, first say that the home that was posted along with this question on the uh, Fine Home Building Forum is beautiful. I think you would all agree, right? Yeah, well, it looks like a lot of homes in, in like Colorado, it reminds me. Can you explain it, explain it, Kylie? That's all, I, I mean, I don't know what that it, style is referred to as. Yeah, what do you think, Rob? I mean, well, I'll just explain it visually. Basically, it's a it's sort of a sprawling home with deep overhangs, and the overhangs have exposed faux ex, uh, extending rafters with big timber brackets, and then they also have timber lintels to you know to mimic the timber lintels lintels that would have been structural in an in an old masonry building, uh, and then it has like a stucco top surface and then like a stone. stone base around stone clad base i think they correctly uh, describe it as me mediterranean inspired right you know that's that's i think I where think the style is. originates yeah and yeah. you see southwestern houses with similar details sometimes yeah. too it comes from a hot dry place right right yeah so now patrick you have been on a job site where you might be able to suggest a wood product that would work well in this situation do you do you remember what i'm talking about i forget what it's called though rob you're but you're talking about the fine home building uh house in greenwich right yep it's called kebony, kebony. and so it's like a take on ebony i assume uh and the, it's the, not ebony <laughs> no say. it's not ebony. I, would, I would think not yeah. um it's it's actually some product that was developed in Norway. It's another one of these uh, molecularly modified wood, you know, stabilized woods. And uh, the way they describe it is it is impregnated with some sort of an alcohol, bio-based alcohol, and then heated. And it creates some sort of polymer in the cellular structure of the wood that, that makes it more weather resistant and stable. 
Um, but uh, yeah, they used it in a very similar application. They they did these uh, lintels over the over the windows on uh, that were wrapped in uh, boral uh, fly ash siding, I think, wasn't it? Or you know, the house had both siding and uh, like cultured stone veneer. So uh, yeah, so it's yeah, a similar I, yeah. application. Yeah. yeah. I thought of Ipe, but that would be really expensive, right? Well, well I, you gotta, I bet the cabinet is um, at yeah, least as expensive. I'm sure it's probably not cheaper. <laughs> I mean, you, really what it comes down to is that there are some woods, like, like Ipe is probably not a bad option, but um, there are woods that are going to be more stable and more weather weather resistant, and you're going to pay more money for them for sure. I would tell in most places not to even do this because this is an element that is just uh, – difficult, right? It's, mm -hmm. is, I would say in some places it's prone to failure because inevitably those timbers are going to take water on, on the uh, end grain. Uh, I mean, it might be a century from now or longer, but it could happen quickly in the right climate. Yeah. Mm, I mean, I think it's key to what he's going for though, in terms of the architectural style. I mean, well, yes. yeah, and but unfortunately architectural style, you know, some of them details just aren't appropriate in all, in all climates, you know? True. There's a reason why that's pop more popular in the Mediterranean climates, right? And, you know, Hot if dry. this can work anywhere, Central Oregon might be the place because I looked up their climate and it's 300 days of sunshine with an annual uh, precipitation of 8 to 22 inches, which is uh, mostly snow in the wintertime. Uh, it yeah. doesn't rain much. Yeah. If they was on the coast in Oregon, I'd say it was a different story. <laughs> bad, yeah. right. bad, bad idea. But Central Oregon, probably not a bad idea. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'd look into this Kebney stuff. I'd, I'd love to talk to, we should talk to BPC builders and see what they, green builders and see if they, well, are you going to head down to that house at, at all soon, Patrick? Maybe you can kind of see how it's weathering on that, on the, the Connecticut FHB house. I will well, totally do very... some, some reconnaissance on the Kebney. I will check into that. <laughs> cool. That hasn't been installed for very long though right yeah but you that's know that's what i would want to know <laughs> <laughs> so so basically if it hasn't been installed for very long and you see signs of weathering then it's a red flag but... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> sure indicator well that's why the ipe i mean i i hear constantly from people that they choose it because then you know they put it in and they're done with it i'll tell you i've got it on my my back stoop uh, mm -hmm. it cost me like a thousand dollars to build the whole stoop covered mm -hmm. in ipe and my neighbor put you know some cedar on his deck next door. And so we have like a side-by-side -side comparison mm -hmm. and I have not touched this stuff. I mean, it's weathered to a gray and I'd like to oil it to bring back some of the color, but it looks as good as the day I installed it. And meanwhile, he replaces cedar deck boards all the time on his deck. So. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think this, there might be some other uh, factors in this science here. Did he yeah. put finish on his cedar? Oh, he, yeah, he has it refinished. In fact, he just had it re uh, cleaned to be refinished. Part of the problem, too, is that the previous deck uh, deck person who did work on his deck put uh, didn't really deal with drainage issues very well. So there's a lot of water collection problems. But uh, this Patrick's sounds apples to exactly. oranges. Yeah, right. it's, I don't know, Rob. This is bad. <laughs> Cedar Bureau is going to sue us. <laughs> I was surprised, actually, um, his comment about the dug fir timbers that, that he has been having trouble with or, or just haven't been living up to what his expectations were. I, I was surprised to hear that because I would think, I don't know, that climate is such that it seems like you'd always be building with dug fir. Well, I think if, you know, you live any place that there's pollen and, like, you know, or biological stuff, you know, it, it's going to grow mold, right, if, if there's rain. Yeah. So flashing detail was the second question. Um, Flash it. So basically, you know, you've got these little inside corners at the bottom of the window, which is the place where a window leaks the most, right? Because that's what it sounds like. It sounds it's like it's sort of like an eye-shaped casing where the, the legs of the casing sticks out on the top and the bottom or the beam sticks out on the top and the bottom. I thought it was more that they were talking about the ends of the like what amounts to headers uh, above the windows. Am, am I wrong the, about that you think? Well no because he said the, the, they, they, the they said stucco. the top detail they've got figured out but at the bottom. I'm talking the, they're talking, I think they're talking about the bottom of the header but I may be wrong. Yeah oh okay yeah 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 I see what you're saying. So the lower left and right corners will be in contact with the stucco. Um, so they're basically saying because the, they, they extend past the window, the stucco kind of wraps all the way around them. That, I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, 
I think you need a good uh, cock joint there with, uh, you know, a backer rod, something, you know, like that is adopted from the industry that seals cracks <laughs> in, you know, big buildings. There's, there's definitely, um, you know, specifications for that. Yeah. And, and the thing is, too, if, if the thing protrudes a little bit and, the, and there's good flashing detail on top, you know, maybe it's not as, as much of a concern if the windows flashed in well and there's a good drainage plane behind the, the stucco, you know? Especially if there's only 10 inches of rain a year. That, that helps a lot. Seems like rain screens with stucco is just imperative. Yeah, you definitely want... Even more so than You definitely want to decouple cladding. your your stucco from, your, from the, the well, layers. Well, so what's really interesting it. to me, though, is like really old stucco... And, you know, when I'm talking about really old stucco in this country, it's, you know, maybe two, 300 years, right? Um, there was no insulation, right? So that was your rain screen. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and more modern stucco, like, has two layers of paper. And the first layer is meant to stick to the stucco. The interior layer is meant to get wrinkled. And then the, those two materials, once the paper dries out, is wrinkly, and that's your drainage plane. It's like it's very... Is it effective? Doesn't... I think it's in the right place, done correctly. Yeah, I mean... But more robust systems are, are more something similar to like a cedar breather that has a lath layer on the outside. So, I mean, if you want, if you want something to be as reliable as possible, sometimes you just have to pay for the extra layers or, do, or buy the right material. That makes it a... a a more um, more likely to succeed yeah. assembly, mm -hmm. or stay away from stucco in rainy places. Maybe <laughs> that's probably good advice. I said to this uh, crew that I was going around with, I was like, "Why don't folks just so so? What happens when you know one of these homes has problems and they end up tearing all the stucco off and redetailing it? Sometimes they." reinstall the windows. Sometimes they don't, you know, and try and integrate the drainage materials into the windows, which seems fraught with peril to me. But then they put stucco back on it. I'm like, why don't they put lap siding on these built, these homes? And he's like, well, it's just not the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. That's something you'd see on a cheap home around here. And, you know, nice homes have stucco. Yeah. yeah. Despite the fact it doesn't work. <laughs> We're human. Uh, we don't always learn from our mistakes. Well, and the consumers are uneducated, right? You know, if someone tells you this is what an expensive home looks like in southeastern Pennsylvania, well, okay. Yeah, That's I mean, they, <laughs> they probably think that either it's it's lived its life and it just needs to be replaced or the last person just didn't know what they were doing and they just need to get it done right. But they never really don't. This problem is so pervasive that – so this part of the country is home to um, our country's chemical industry, Right. And uh, the executives who work for the chemical giants in the in the area uh, often relocate to this area from other places. And the companies that re relocate these folks um, require stucco inspections as part of a real estate transfer. Uh, so <laughs> that tells you how pervasive it is. Hmm. I am currently designing a mansard roof, which will become a new third story on top of an existing structure. The steep portion of the mansard will be clad in slate shingles over zip system roof sheathing and closed cell spray foam insulation in the stud base. The flat portion of the room will be EPDM roofing over zip system roof sheathing over TJIs with closed cell insulation in the, in the base. Will it be necessary to provide ventilation baffles in the steep portion of the roof behind the slate shingles? In addition, should the flat portion of the roof also remain unvented? Venting the flat portion of the roof seems as though it will be inviting moisture intrusion. Please note that the entire third floor space will be conditioned. Okay, team, what do we think? Go ahead, Jeff. You've been quiet today. Um, yeah, I, I think unvented assembly. <laughs> unvented. Okay, that's one vote, unvented. That's what Kylie? Mark, I would say that um, judging from what I read or, or about venting mansard roofs, that unvented it would be the way to go. It unvented. sounds like it's... Two Sounds for like invented. Diff difficult to do. Rob, you're always the contrarian. What are you going to do? Do we know what climate zone we're talking about here? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you're going to like <laughs> bring subtleties <laughs> into this? <laughs> no, I mean, I would say, you know, it's a hot roof assembly if it's detailed correctly, unvented. But I also feel like there's a couple of things I want to get to in a minute that might 
might oh my god we were on a roll we were gonna give a you know brief uh conclusive answer (laughs) and then you had to screw that all up (laughs) no i said i I still i agree though invented okay all right so what's the nuance you want to bring up well so um we were talking uh, we haven't really gotten into the details yet but basically um I was talking about an EPDM on the flat portion of the roof, EPDM layer, and doing spray foam in that layer of the roof. And I'm almost wondering if the... Ah, thank goodness you're back. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, what the heck? I, I don't know. So that was me again? Yeah. Which is so weird because, like, I tested my internet connection before So, we... folks listening... Uh... Rob was just about to say something really profound and interesting when he suddenly lost uh, his internet connection. I think Patrick has a button that he can hit when, he, when he's, ti- <laughs> when he's tired, of, tired of my answers. I want that button. <laughs> oh, my God. So we have to write Squadcast and say that's the feature for the next uh, edition. Yeah. <laughs> You're fine. So it's funny, you know... I, you guys may or may not know that I had some uh, radio training as part of my college program, and um, radio boards used to have a dump button. It was just a red button, boom, lose the <laughs> caller who starts saying profane or crazy things, right? Yep. I didn't right, know Jeff? that about you. See, this yep. is more evidence that I think that this is Patrick <laughs> at work here. <laughs> okay, Rob, just give a simple answer and move on. <laughs> So what were you going to say about the, the well, walls well, assembly so here? So he's talking about, you know, EPDM and how you do that over the sheathing because he's doing zip sheathing. And, well, you know, EPDM in a lot of commercial settings on low slope roofs would be done right over the insulation. So I'm wondering if they want to design a system where the top flat portion Thank has some rigid, you. rigid foam insulation on top. So Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's going to work be... better too. You're going to stop the thermal bridging and you can put, you know, cavity insulation in there too. And you could do something way less expensive than spray foam. Spray foam, right. That uh, whole and something with cheaper. way less global warming potential than spray foam. You know, it's, I think we should say definitively that we're telling folks to use less spray foam because it is, you know, not good for the planet. And on top of that, then you could basically basically wrap the whole thing in a continuous layer of rigid foam, do furring strips as your base skip sheathing for the slate, and you got a nice uh, your sort of vented assembly there, but in a way that actually is not a not a, a risky situation. I want to stress too that I don't think that's enough uh, insulation in the walls. I mean. If you've ever been on a slate roof, it's freaking hot. I mean, it is will burn your hands. Uh, so, it you know, you're going to need more insulation on the other side of that slate if you want to have that room at all comfortable in the summertime. Yeah. So do something to stop the thermal bridging there, too, I would say. But, but yeah, for the top, I would say look at commercial roof. We've got even articles about this, but basically commercial roof assemblies, EPDM. We've talked about this kind of stuff on the podcast before about how if you're going to do an assembly like that, it's been a well-tested, you know, assembly that's done in in every flat roof building, commercial building there is, you know. And they don't fail. Diami tells me when they have windstorms like Sandy, that the, those roofs were fine, largely. You know, if they were done correctly, they they held up really well. So, are you talking about slate roofs still? No, no, no. I'm talking oh, about say- the rubber roofs. I can't imagine a slate roof would hold up all that well in that kind of situation. Well, they're heavy. And they've been, they, you know, they last a hundred years if they're done right. The cool thing about slate roofs is they can be repaired too. You know, seldom is a roof completely destroyed right, in its right. entirety. You ever done any <laughs> slating uh, podcasters? It appeals to me. I think there's something really cool about it. I don't oh, know what gorgeous, I would slate. Yeah. <laughs> I think having you, almost been hit in the head with a few slate pieces <laughs> off my roof, I got nervous about that. <laughs> structural integrity of them because i think they're so expensive to maintain right yeah you certainly want the right people to be and so people don't do it right it's we were just talking when we lost rob uh how beautiful a mansard roof looks with slate on it like it's a really cool look it's interesting i don't like them without slate but when i see one with slate i think okay that that's really sharp yeah because i don't know what what else you do? You can't put siding on it, right? And you can't, like, asphalt shingles look really kind of goofy. That's what so, I think it is. Yeah. I've seen them with asphalt shingles. I've, it does look goofy. I saw one the other day with siding on it, though, had clabberts. 
<laughs> what do you think? Play. Really? Did it look yeah. dumb? It was pretty silly. Yeah. 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 It was, like, it was my, obviously not miles. the original roof. Yeah. Mm. What do you but, say, uh, Jeff? There's there's one near my house and it's hideous. Yeah. Mm. It's something you can there's really like screw up. Tan vinyl siding on it. It's like <laughs> God. <laughs> it's horrible. Are um would you say that original mansard roof houses typically are one and a half story houses? No, I mean the the, the, the whole second... point. The whole point of a mansard roof. It's it came. I think it was in Paris in like the eighteen hundreds. Was there was um and may, f tell me if I'm wrong. If this is an old wives' tale, but uh, pretty much there was a tax on every floor of the house of a okay. building, and so mansard roofs were a way to get an entire additional floor and skirt that tax. That and sense. so a mansard roof, as opposed to like. Um, you know, any other type uh, yeah. of roof is, is a way to get a, almost a full floor. Almost. It's almost a full floor, right? Yeah. I mean, you're only losing the, whatever that slope of the roof is, which is not very much. No. Okay. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's a nearly, I mean, almost an entire floor, right? It's it's inches you're losing from the mm -hmm. slope, right? You could still furnish the, unlike, uh, you know, rafters that go to the floor level, right? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the, the most common place you've seen in, in this country is, what is it, the 1880s or 90s, the Second Empire, Victorian-style mm -hmm. houses. So if you go to old New England downtowns, you'll see plenty of them. Uh, the other thing we were saying is, can you imagine the amount of work to keep one of those things going, like with the two sets of overhangs because of the you know transitional roof and then flashing uh, above all the windows because they're in the you know path of the roof water? It's It seems like a beautiful form that is going to keep you busy. <laughs> <laughs> well put. <laughs> uh, this comes from Dan. I'm removing the 30 year old wall to wall carpet in my four bedrooms and installing new three quarter inch solid red oak hardwood. I'm leaning toward three and a quarter inch wide boards. I've pulled up the rugs and see a few metal straps sticking out from the wall plate. What are these straps and are they performing a needed function? Can I just cut them out? Um, so did you guys look at this? Let's answer yeah. this question real yeah. quick. Yeah. If you cut those straps, the whole house is just going to collapse. <laughs> <laughs> what are they? I didn't, I they're, figure they're, out. they're straps that they use in aiding raising walls, usually on they're second, the, second yeah, floors. The steel bands that wrap the lumber package. Some carpenters use little pieces of them to keep oh. the wall from slipping off the floor when you're raising it. Right. It's, it's a safer way to, to put, to raise the walls on upper levels because you basically nail it to the floor, the plate, the bottom plate on the wall as you're after you framed it and it prevents the bottom of the wall from kicking out and falling off the off of the house when you're raising it up don't do this people because you've made a little gap there that's going to leak a lot of air a m much bigger amount than you can ever imagine and it's funny in this photo you can actually see what happens those straps are all rusted because they're the condensing surface from the air leaks right steel and uh, you can see the water staining around them too which i'm guessing is related so don't do that Oh, you come know, on, you just, can caulk it afterwards, can you? You could, sure. But why not just like pick up the wall <clears throat> and not push it off the floor? That's what I would say to do. I mean, there's there's a bunch of different ways. I'll find some of the tips on our website. We actually had a video tip about that method of I've raising seen people walls. nail the the plate to the to the subfloor when yeah, you know before they raise, the you toenail it, right? it down and mm -hmm. the nails pull out when you raise it. Yeah. Do that. Anyway. Do you think those straps are sort of at the root of his problem here? In terms of the water mm, No, because he was saying he solved some other reef, roof roof, and window leak issues because the, the, the water damage actually goes up the wall, so it's not even just on the floor. Maybe I should read the rest of this so folks know what the heck we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, also, I have a couple areas near the outside walls where the plywood subfloor has water stains from past water intrusion issues, leaky roof slash windows. The water intrusion was resolved years ago, but was wondering how to determine if the subfloor is okay. And do I need to replace stained portions? It seems structurally sound is not delaminated or swollen. I do have some hairline cracking. I have some hairline cracks in other non-stained areas too. I read that if the subfloor is water damage, it can impact the flooring nails holding strength. I provided a picture of the worst water stain, which is in the closet. Any comments or suggestions appreciated, Dan. Uh, Dan, just, you know, I'd say use a, a pick or an awl or whatever and just poke around the subfloor. If it seems fine, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, if you're really worried in the worst part, you can maybe drill a little hole or cut a little hole in the floor just to see if the lower layers of the plywood look punky. Uh, you know, basically the same kind of stuff that Kylie should be doing to her front step. In the house. <laughs> well, isn't, isn't this one of the... <laughs> 
<laughs> Isn't this one of those situations where he should like actually measure the moisture content of the wood? Or is I that mean, too, is that you guys are really silly? getting particular. Uh, I mean, he's, I he's talking about putting down some beautiful flooring. I, 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 there's a part of me that wonders, like, doesn't he want to know what's going on throughout I mean, the whole hurts. assembly? It never hurts to check those things, but uh, but at the same time, he did say that he solved the water leak problems a long time ago. So. But he's also saying he doesn't know what's going, you know, like, I don't know. It's not just the, f in, in my mind, I'm thinking beyond the subfloor. Like, what else is going on beneath the subflooring? Well, that's what you always think about. I can tell. <laughs> Day and night. Can't get it off my mind. No, I'm just curious. I mean, he's he's clearly investing some night some some money in this nice floor and well, yes, it goes without saying that if if the house is leaking, you got to fix that before you put new hardwood floor in, right? But he they but Dan I mean, says that he fixed that stuff. What I'm trying to get stuff. at is that he he may have fixed that stuff, but the, the water damage that he's seeing on his subfloor could it also have penetrated into the joists or, you know, beyond the subfloor. What else is happening down there that might affect his ultimate finish? Well, those those are those are good questions. Dan yeah. might want to poke around with the moisture meter. Isn't he supposed to just tear it all apart? <laughs> <laughs> we and then tell figure you to do it out. That. <laughs> yeah, tell him to rip it all up and take some pictures and send them to yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> Call it, get back to us. <laughs> no, I wouldn't worry about it, Dan. Provided you fix the, fix the water damage and the, the subfloor seems fine. I would say that in most cases, the subfloor would show damage from water intrusion uh, before the joist, because the joist presumably can dry to the underside. I don't know. Maybe I'm uh, overly optimistic here, but I think it's going to be evident if the joists are damaged. Hopefully, there's a way that he can, you know, look at that without having to rip down a ceiling. Yeah, and if it's not, if like you said, if the wood's not punky from poking it with an awl or, or driving a screw into it, um, and if it's if the water in unstained areas is is similarly, you know, in similar condition. And he's not seeing any swelling or any soft spots, then yeah, it's probably all right. Uh, and, and definitely, Dan, read up on how to measure the materials for moisture. Like, so people have this idea, and I'll try and keep it really brief here, but people have this idea you want to acclimate flooring. Well, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. It depends on what the moisture content of the uh, flooring is when you get it and what it should be like in, in, in its equilibrium mode, like not its highest content seasonally and not its lowest. So you, you want to get it uh, at that sweet spot. And sometimes that means uh, putting it in right away. Sometimes that means acclimating it. Sometimes it means using dehumidification to dry it out. Um, so it's more nuanced than people will lead you to believe. They say, oh yeah, just buy two weeks ahead of time, we put it in the building. Well, maybe that's the worst thing to do because if it's a new building, it's losing moisture from its concrete foundation. It's losing moisture from when the, when the subfloor got rained on, you know, it's, and when the walls were plastered or drywalled. So it's, it's definitely more complicated than uh, folks who will comment at the bar will tell you. Can you point them to an article about that, Patrick? Do you have something about that? Seems like a Kylie, great article. Um, so there's the wood flooring installation guidelines. Um, where is that? One of those wood flooring associations. I'll I'll look it up because uh, they, there's definitely documentation of of the, the the changes in attitude about that process. And uh, and it depends where you live, right? Because uh, it's affected time by of year, yeah probably. the normal humidity conditions. For yeah, because basically you what are. you're trying to do is you're trying to find out between like the the wettest and driest season in your region, how, but it also depends on how well your house is conditioned. If you live in a house that has no air conditioning you're and it's really leaky, you're going to see a huge swing in humidity. But if you live in a very tight, well-conditioned house, you're going to have less of a concern about swings in moisture content in the interior. The other thing I'm going to say, Dan, is uh, it takes way more nails to install hardwood flooring than almost anyone realizes. Like to do it correctly, you got to put a ton of nails in it. So those, uh, you know, specs are also in that um, Wood Flooring Manufacturers Association document that Rob's going to find. Did you see how I suddenly made that problem? <laughs> it's your <Rob>? job. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, this comes from, from Dak. Hello, FHB podcast people. Love the show. It's the first thing I listen to on a Saturday morning. The house on the cover of the July 2021 issue of Fine Home Building is awesome, especially the outdoor room, but I'm wondering about a few things. Does this make sense in climates any colder than Ontario? It looks like 
anyone staying in the upper level bedroom at the south end would have to go downstairs and then back upstairs if they were staring, staying there between October and March. Do you think this would get tiresome over time? Do you have any suggestions on achieving a similar indoor space in a long, narrow box like the featured house? Perhaps dual garage doors that don't look like garage doors. Let's get weird. Thanks for any thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> this is essentially the house I'm designing now, except ours is one story. Well, weird is what you're all about, Rob Wadsack, so you go first. <laughs> you know, it's it, this kind of like touches on something that I think about. It's like how we're, we're constantly telling people to build these like hermetically sealed houses wherever all the living happens on the inside. And it's like, I can really get behind this house with the outdoor room. It's like that. So this house, the downstairs, which is sort of a uh, walkout basement, right? Kylie it, yeah. it is, it is a below grade on one side open on the other side is like uh, more of the casual living space. It includes a guest room. And then there's a staircase that goes up to another guest room on one side of the house. But then the main public portion of the house is split by this beautiful covered outdoor space in between and the house is wrapped in lots of glass and so presumably someone in the guest suite would have to go downstairs across the rec room up at another flight of stairs to get into the kitchen or the living room um if the weather was inc if it was inclement weather but i'd say this house is beautiful. If you're a guest in this house, walk around it. Yeah. Tuck it up. <laughs> throw, it. Throw, a coat, throw a sweatshirt on and a hat and walk across yeah. the outdoor room. And and that's, the <laughs> that's exactly what they do. I, I, I asked the architect these questions. Uh, it was a story I worked on. And, um, and that was exactly his point, Rob, is that f people value the privacy of having what feels like kind of a, a separate, separate space. Yeah. yeah. And um, for the most part, given their climate and they just cut through the outdoor room most of the year, unless it's like really bad weather. Where is it, Kylie? The house? It's in, oh, the, you know. Is it on is Lake it? Ontario? No, it's, it's in, what is that lake called? Let me look it up. I forget the name of the lake. Um, but it's in a cold place is I guess cold, the point yeah. I'm trying, trying to make. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's Ontario. It's on, oh, so right. This guy's question was other than Ontario. So I'd say Ontario is pretty freaking Toronto. cold. It's cold. That's cold, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a cold climate. Yeah. But he said, you know, that's neither here nor there for most of their guests. They don't, they're not bothered by that. Um, yeah. And the, the point that, he, that they made is that uh, this is like having a guest cottage, yeah. but it's a protected guest cottage. So it's mm -hmm. like, you, like you said, you're going, you have the option if you really need to, to go through the, through the, the lower, more casual parts of the house and take two flights of stairs. But most of the time you're going to be there. It's going to be either a nice snowy day in the winter or a nice warm day in the summer. And even, even if it isn't, you know, you have to walk 30 feet to get from your little cottage under a big protected roof. So, uh, I, I think it's cool, but, uh, um, talking about the glass though, I mean, what, what kind of glass did they put in this house, Kylie? Is it double pane, triple pane? Do it's you know? triple pane. I'm pretty sure it's triple pane. <clears throat> I don't yeah. remember if we the, talked, we yeah. didn't talk at length about it. The folks um, who can afford to build this house, like are getting good windows, right? It would be right. silly to, uh, cheap out on that. Cause he said that it, he originally did talk about like this listener Dak was asking about and his original design included the idea or included, um, screens for insects. And he also planned to, um, or he was considering glass garage doors, like the listener mentioned, um, on the windy side, but he didn't like how the tracks looked um, hanging in the space. Um, and then the position of the doors when they were open, he didn't, he didn't think he was going to like that either. Um, but to get at this guy's question, um, he, he suggested that there might be a way to install garage doors with, an inc with inclined tracks following the ceiling or some other type of roll-up door if they were looking to make it. I mean, more affordable. Well, more affordable. I mean, he uses it year round. They use it year round um, in Ontario. So mm -hmm. it yeah. doesn't need to be glassed in. Um, but they're outdoor <laughs> enthusiasts. They're comfortable with some breeze, you know. Yeah. Well, we just had a recent, just recently, uh, Tina Govan, an architect from Durham, North Carolina, who's been our longtime contributor to Fine Home Building, did a webinar for us. Um, at our request because she specializes in connecting houses to their site and mm -hmm. making these sort of transitional outdoor spaces that have 
oftentimes very soft boundaries so that you're sort of in, you're you're enjoying the site and you're not just being stuck in the house. Right. And uh, in many of her houses, she's had similar details where they've had, depending on the um, initiative of the of the homeowners, they've had, you know, the big multi folding sliding doors or in one case they had a porch that had removable panels and they just removed them and stored them elsewhere uh when the you know when they wanted it to be the seat when it was the season for it to be wide open uh, but there, there are a lot of options for pocket doors and custom things but in, as, as they pointed out in this particular situation they liked it the way they like it the way it is uh, but there there are a lot of options for sure i, I will, think I we've will mentioned help. it mm -hmm. go ahead I was just going to note that he did rough in um, provisions for by folding glass doors across the 12 foot opening. Um, mm -hmm. And, and all this is like a smaller openings. They provided um, future flip up glass panels, um, but he doesn't anticipate using either of those things, but they're there if he yeah. decides they want to enclose it to some degree. Well, especially since this space, this outdoor space doesn't have a flat ceiling. It, it, it's, it's open to this beautiful timber frame structure above. So it's like, you don't want to, put any right. anything, anything up in the there way that it, would yeah. detract yeah. from the looks of that but i think you could options. use uh commercial uh storefront glazing systems you know we i think we've mentioned that on the house i think that would be a cool application to uh you know get this glassed in space yeah or on a, you know on, on a place like this that's like obviously a custom build if you have an adjacent wall that's really um th that works out for it I mean, maybe you build a big barn sliding door that hangs off a track under the overhang and you have windows in it. And maybe those windows align with the existing windows in the house or maybe you get a, a wall that's big enough that you don't have windows that to obscure, you know? So there's there's so many different oh, options. Oh man, you are getting weird. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you have any thoughts on this uh, indoor outdoor space? Um, no, I, I don't. I haven't, haven't seen the, the house. So. Well, let me, I'm let curious me to see. On. I'd love to see Dax. Um, he says he's building essentially the same house, or he's designing it. It's the design he's working on. I'd love to keep us posted. I'd like to see what what his house looks like, and if he incorporates some rendition of this idea. You were mentioning cool. Kylie to me yesterday. You were surprised to see a fine home building design story as the cover uh, feature. Yeah, uh, have we ever done that before? Not in my time. Oh here. yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh, for I sure. Yeah. That. yeah. I guess I don't know the covers that well. Yeah, it was exciting. I mean, I've been a, I've been with the company for three years. It's the first time I've seen a design cover. So it doesn't happen a lot. I know that much. I tried to explain the fireplace to Carol last night about, because we were talking about that space. And, uh, yeah. The outdoor got, like, fireplace? No, it's, it's in Are the they? indoor. It's got like a detail above the hearth or mm -hmm. above the firebox. It's like a collection of cobbles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which That's, I think is kind of cool. It's very cool. He was, uh, you know, I don't know if you read the story, but the, the, his, thought, his thinking there was that area um, all around that lake um, is known for its um, geology and uh, people really appreciate the, the rock formations. And um, there are a lot of fire ch uh, chimneys that are built with that kind of stone, but he calls them cocoa puff chimneys. And I think you can picture perfectly what he's talking about those little round <laughs> yeah. stones all mortared together um and so this is his sort of like tribute to the area's um rock you know it, it, without just, actually doing, without actually yeah. doing it so he's got a uh, you yeah. know part of the chimney but but in an abstract way i thought it was really nice looking too yeah, basically I would say it's a pretty affordable uh, wall street. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just a shelf full of rocks. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, what is it like? Maybe eight or ten shelves up there. It's yeah. It's kind of a neat, neat architectural detail. I've never seen anything like it. It's cool. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll put a link to that article for sure in the show notes. But or you can just go to findhomeland.com slash magazine and see the whole latest issue. Wow, that was a seamless plug. <laughs> right. <laughs> Top he's, things today. He's good at those. <laughs> Usually I'm not. Patrick's like, okay, what do you have to talk about this week? Um, um. <laughs> uh, so we want to remind folks to please get a uh, all access or web subscription or magazine subscription. It really does help us pay the bills. Uh, you know, we had our company meeting yesterday and things seem all, all right, but it, uh, we need your help always. 
Yeah. And we're making the website better and better. I mean, it's full of great stuff, but we're trying to make it more organized, as we've said before, the project guides. The Windows and Door project guide is live now, and uh, next month we'll have a new tiling project guide. Nice. Those are sweet spots of our content, right, Rob? Mm -hmm. How many yeah. window articles are there? I bet there's dozens. Oh, I mean, there's each one of these project guides has at least 150 pieces of content, you know, <laughs> probably dozens of videos. And uh, that doesn't even necessarily represent everything that's on our site because we got lots of tips on the site on these topics. But we basically handpicked what we think are, are the essential pieces of articles and videos on, on the top, on each topic. You pulled from the books too, right? Taunton that's, books? that's true. That's a good point. We've actually, uh, you know, Taunton over the years has done comprehensive books on all of our major topics. And uh, we've done uh, dozens of uh, book excerpts in, in these project guides um, that, that sort of bolster our already uh, rich collection of content. So. Well, like some things like Larry Hahn's, you know, framing content is, is, uh, who the heck could do that better? Right. This is like, you have to get it from there. Right. Yeah. Oh boy. So, you know, this is our, uh, exposed duct themed episode of oh, the is podcast. That that photo? I was wondering yep. what that photo yeah. was. Well, we started and ended with it. It's totally <laughs> I was reading through like, who's talking about this? That's the end note. Okay. So, um, do you guys want Kylie, do you want to try and describe no, the photo? No, I can't describe that. I don't have the language for it. That's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, that's a it, Rob. That's that's Rob's description right there. You so take it, take it away. It, it kind of so it's this brick commercial building. It looks like maybe a school or an apartment or something. Uh, Nursing um, home. Uh, yeah, and um, they decided, I guess, to add some air conditioning to it. It kind of looks like it kind of looks like some like alien spacecraft is like trying to suck <laughs> things out of the building. I don't know. It's like they, they put, they ran all the duct work on top of the roof in these big, uh, you know, square ducts, but then they didn't want to puncture the roof into every single unit that needed the duct work. So they actually made these C shaped ducts that wrap around the overhang of the roof and then puncture the brick clad <laughs> wall in between every single window on the side of the building. So it's, qu it's quite, quite <laughs> an assemblage. That? Somebody sent it to us yeah, in the podcast. Uh, podcast oh, listeners it was Wayne. Sent it to us. Was it Wayne? I didn't see that. Mike. Mike. Oh, yeah. He he sent it with the subject line, caption this picture. And oh, I, okay, I, okay, I couldn't okay. think of anything to do it justice, except <laughs> it did seem to fit with our exposed duck work uh, episode. My caption would be something Rob <laughs> might attempt. <laughs> Oh, no, we wouldn't. Would no. you know? So, so now the thing is, I, I was like, you know, how often do you see something that this is this crazy looking? You see so, every single building in Las Vegas when you're on the Las Vegas monorail <laughs> is done like this is what you see. Well, really? so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, um, I went and, and did a Google search to try to find some other examples of similarly horrible duct <laughs> installations. And I was surprisingly, you know, I'm like, do it. Our job shouldn't be to highlight the worst. It should be to inspire to do better stuff. And, and I stumbled upon this company called Thermoduct. And it's a company that does duct systems like this. They sell the products. And they have these double layer insulated yeah. duct systems with smooth outsides that are that are UV resistant and meant to be flashed with special flashing tape. And they have up to an R24 insulation on these ducts. Yeah, you can do this right, but this this is not that. <laughs> so, but I'll tell you, this thermoduct company actually has a, a um a um installation that works for the spiral duct interiors that we were talking about, which is a smooth insulated duct, so that you have uh, that would be for condensation control, presumably condensation control, and also ease of uh, sealing the joints because the joints have smooth transitions so uh, it was like an r6 i think cool yeah so i'm gonna ask them to be a sponsor of the show <laughs> right thermoduct just go to... already got one episode <laughs> yeah just go to thermoduct.com <laughs> uh, well unfortunately that is all the time we have for today thanks to rob kylie and jeff for joining me and thanks to all of you for listening Please remember to send us your questions, comments, suggestions, and spiral duck photos to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. That helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Happy building and keep craft alive.